Hello and welcome to the night studio here at the museum. I'm Frank Bond and I'll be your host for this edition of Inside Media. In this week's program, in keeping with our reflections on 9-11 theme for the weekend, our two guests give us an opportunity to pull back the curtain on the inner workings of both the press and, and the FBI during the search for an ultimate killing of Osama bin Laden and the investigation of Al-Qaeda since 9-11. These have been at the core of our understanding of the war on terror from its inception to the present. In 1997, our first guest, Peter Bergen, produced Osama bin Laden's first television interview to a Western audience, and in that interview, bin Laden declared war against the United States. Peter is now director of the National Security Studies Program of the New America Foundation. That's a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy institute, an author and journalist for both print and broadcast. Bergen also serves as CNN's national security analyst. His most recent book is The Longest War, The Enduring Conflict Between America and Al-Qaeda. John Miller's career has coursed through journalism and law enforcement. He was a broadcast journalist in New York for 19 years before serving as deputy police commissioner and chief spokesman for the NYPD, 1994-95. Returning to broadcasting, John was a correspondent for eight ABC News in 1998 when he interviewed Osama bin Laden. And John was with Peter Jennings at the anchor desk during their coverage of the 9-11 attacks. In 2003, John Miller was Bureau Chief for Counterterrorism and Criminal Intelligence with the Los Angeles Police Department, and then he joined the FBI as Assistant Director for Public Affairs. He is now a security consultant. Please help join me in welcoming John Miller and Peter Bergen. Peter, as we look back 10 years on the attack on 9-11, we have been told that uh, Al-Qaeda is planning some sort of attack against the United States. How would you characterize our ability to detect and stop such an attack now 10 years after that attack? Well, it's substantially different. I mean, the FBI, where John was an assistant uh, director uh, on 9-11, my guess is there were probably you know, a few dozen counterterrorism analysts. Now there are 2,000 analysts at the FBI alone. And, uh, and you can, you know, the TSA didn't exist. I mean, that may be a sort of mixed blessing there. But, uh, you know, obviously if the TSA <laughs> had existed, none of the hijackers would have got on the plane because the, the, the kind of knives they were carrying, DHS didn't exist, the Department of Homeland Security didn't exist. There were only 16 people on the no-fly list on 9-11. Now there are thousands. I mean, you, you can just go through you know, a litany of, of reasons that it, it's a very hard target right now. So when there have been people from the Pakistani Taliban or, or Al-Qaeda who've tried to do something, um, you know, they've, they've been foiled. And, and one other point, it's the public also. I mean, public awareness. I mean, just think about this alert that you just mentioned. You know, tens of millions of people in the United States are aware of the fact that there is this uh, sort of uh, amorphous threat out there, and if they see something, they're going to say something about it. <laughs> and that wouldn't have been true, uh, you know, before 9-11, or much less likely. Yeah. John Miller, how important was the killing of Osama bin Laden in really thwarting the ability of Al-Qaeda to, to strike big the way they did even before 9-11? I'm not sure, Frank, that it was important to that. Um, it, it's, it's a largely misunderstood event. Um, people who say, you know, with the death of bin Laden is the death of Al-Qaeda are just wrong. Uh, but people who say the death of bin Laden didn't matter at all are also wrong. It's actually somewhere in between. Here was a guy who was so hidden away and so insulated, he wasn't able to run day-to-day -day operations and be the inspirational person in the camps, inspiring the actual acolytes and soldiers. But what he was able to do was to set the corporate direction for Al-Qaeda. Major attacks, not small attacks, focus on attacking the West, less than attacking um, other countries where conflicts existed, um, even and Muslim countries. So that direction has been lost. Uh, but I think it's a victory with complications, as Police Commissioner Ray Kelly refers to it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a blessing in that you took out the symbolic head, and that is an injury to the organization. But it also comes with elevating his status as a martyr, perhaps, uh, spurring revenge killings, even on the part of people who might not be associated with Al-Qaeda directly, but inspired by these events and the calls for revenge. Peter, how would, would you add to Al-Qaeda after bin Laden? You know, when you join Al-Qaeda, you, uh, there are many differences between the Nazi party and Al-Qaeda, but there's one similarity, which is when you joined the Nazi party, you didn't swear a personal oath of, to Nazism, you swore a personal oath of allegiance to Adolf Hitler. 
And so when you joined Al-Qaeda, you swore, swore a personal oath of allegiance to bin Laden. His successor, you know, is, uh, it's a kind of cliche, but he's much less charismatic. In fact, uh, John met with his successor, Ayman al-Zawari, in 98. Um, you know, in some ways, from an American national security perspective, if leaving Zawahiri as the number one would be a pretty good outcome because he's gonna manage this, what remains of this, into the ground. He's not a very well-regarded or even well-liked even by people in his own Egyptian group. So, um, you know, the, the prognosis for al-Qaeda is, is pretty bad. And, and it's not just the death of bin Laden. The, the number two was killed in a drone strike on August 22nd. Uh, one of their senior guys was just arrested on Friday in Pakistan. And, you know, the most dangerous job in the world was being al-Qaeda's number three and now not al-Qaeda's number two. And I just think at a certain point, people are going to say, hey, I don't want that job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, really. <laughs> well, obviously, it was the 9-11 attack that, that really put uh, bin Laden in, in our awareness, even though he was already on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. In a video you can see downstairs in our documentary theater, John Miller talks about how he came to interview the terrorists that the general public had yet to meet. This is where we have best laid plans. I'm waiting for my control room. In 1998, John Miller of ABC News interviewed Osama bin Laden, a terrorist largely unknown in America at the time. We must use punishment to keep your evil away from Muslims, Muslim women and children. Miller knew the FBI had tied bin Laden to the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center, but the media at large paid little attention to the subsequent trials. And all the details of Al-Qaeda and its plans and leaders spilled out. <clears throat> Hardly got any coverage because there was another case that was so much more interesting. It was O.J. Simpson and it was unfolding in Los Angeles. And around 1997, it was beginning to crystallize. And the question was, was he running operations or was he an inspirational leader and a financier? And at the ABC News Investigative Unit, we decided, let's try and answer those questions. This was the one single interview of my career that actually got bigger as time went on. A man on a hilltop backed by a few hundred Mujahideen soldiers declaring war on the United States. But it's not a conventional war that he's threatening. Bin Laden is talking about terrorism. I think the idea of ABC News the American Broadcasting Company resonated with them. Nightline turned it down. World News turned it down. Nobody wanted this interview for two reasons. One, it was expensive. And two, they couldn't understand that it was a big deal. Because again, in 1997-98, no one really knew who Osama bin Laden was in the general public. John, talk to us a little bit about that period after the collapse of the Soviet Union when we really did see American news organizations pull back on their international bureaus, one of the most expensive areas of coverage there is. What price do we pay by not having constant coverage all over the world the way we did during the Cold War? Well, I, I think you saw a big shift in the news business um, at that same time towards um, less of a hard edge, less of the kind of just the facts ma'am reporting, uh, more features, more interest in famous people and kind of the people magazine genre comes to TV. And stories like this, particularly international stories, you know, there was a term, you could have actually looked it up in the dictionary at one point called Afghanistanism. Mm -hmm. And it meant an inordinate focus on places that <laughs> were so obscure that they didn't matter in the normal discourse and of course, it's an ironic term looking back at it uh, today because how much does Afghanistan actually matter in our daily lives? Yes. An awful lot. Yes, yes. Uh, but I'll, I'll defer to Peter on that because he was, he was on the other end of that equation. When I was covering local news, he was, he was covering international news during the very time that they started to peel back. You know, I mean, I, 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 I think there's a very complicated answer to that, which I, I don't think there's any golden age in journalism. Like there was no perfect moment. I mean. If you want to be informed about the world, you can be more informed about the world. Let's say you want to find out everything there is to know about Bahrain. In 15 minutes, anybody in this room can know more about Bahrain than 
most people would have been able to do, do if they'd studied it for years. That's largely because of the internet. Because of the internet, yeah. And so there has been, been this drawing back. There has, I mean, I do the thought, I mean, this is a question for John. You know, when I went to my bosses at CNN and said, you know, there's this guy called Bin Laden you've never heard of, I think he might be a significant, you know, they said, okay, it's gonna take months, it's kind of dangerous, it's gonna cost a lot of money, and they said, why don't you go and do that, that's fine. Now, uh, you weren't a very valued employee. <laughs> <by the way. laughs> I, was actually, I was actually under contract. So. No, 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 actually, you were, my, yeah, that's right, that's right. We'll, we'll pick you know, I was dressing in color, you were still dressing in black and white. <laughs> Pick it up right there and give us a sense of, of what it was like physically getting to that interview and, and doing that interview, that sit down. Um, well, I've forgotten most of the details. Mm -hmm. Truly. No. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the more memorable moments of my life, sure. as I'm sure it is for John. No, I mean, you know, I think John and I had a very similar experience. It was, I mean, they put us through a lot of, it, it, you know, Bin Laden didn't wake up on September 12, 2001 saying, hey, I'm gonna start worrying about my personal security. This is a very a guy who's being paranoid, secretive, disciplined. The other people around him are paranoid, secretive, disciplined. That's one of the reasons it took so long to find him. And you know, they treated us in a very, you know, they were very suspicious of us. Are you agents of the CIA? Will you give this guy a fair shake? They made us you know, go through Pakistan. They were kind of vetting us all the time. Multiple layers of vetting. Then you know, at the, you know, the, the final interview, involved uh, you know, changes of vehicles in the middle of the night, being blindfolded. Everybody involved had a rocket propelled grenade or a submachine gun. They searched us very carefully. They swept us for an electronic tracking device. I mean, they were not, and they also, by the way, told us not to bring anything with us, even our watch. You know, just, we were, they were gonna provide the camera. They were very concerned about, you know, might the camera contain some sort of tracking device. So, you know, it, it was an amazing experience. Of course, we couldn't film any of it. <laughs> um, and um, you know, but uh, it was quite it was quite a performance. And then when he he appeared out of the night, anybody in this room knows considerably more about him than we did at the time. I didn't even know quite what he had looked like. Um, and he, you know, his appearance was, you know, he was, um, you know, John and I think had the same. He kind of comported himself like a cleric. He didn't. I was expecting this kind of table thumping revolutionary. And he, you know, if you didn't know what he was talking about, it was like he was reading the phone book. He was very kind of low key. But in fact, his words were full of rage against the United States. Certainly, it's the journalism has played a big role in, in helping shaping public perception about Al Qaeda. How would you characterize our understanding of that network now in the 10 years since 9-11? In fact, based on the journalism that has been done, I, I want to find out from both of you. You know, I think our understanding, I mean, I'm talking about from the public perspective, mm -hmm. our understanding mm -hmm. of the network is almost pretty close to the government's in that I think journalists have done an excellent job, particularly the people who cover national security, uh, talking about the shifting leadership, the shifting modes of attack, the shifting priorities of Al-Qaeda. Um, and I think Peter, in his dual-hatted world of journalist on CNN as a commentator on, on terrorism, but also in his work uh, with think tanks where they've done actual surveys mm -hmm. in the federally administered tribal areas, not exactly the easiest place to just hire Gallup to do a poll, <laughs> right, right, yeah. um, where, and, and I think he, he should talk about that, but where they've actually found out what people think of Al-Qaeda there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what are you finding? Well, in the case of this, we did a poll in the federal minister tribal areas. It, it was interesting, a lot of hostility to President Obama because of the drone attacks, but also quite a lot of hosti hostility to the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. So uh, it's kind of a kind of nuanced picture. These people don't like the fact that there are a lot of American drone attacks in this area, but they also are no fans of the Taliban or Al-Qaeda. Uh, but I, you know, in terms of the, the general coverage, um, I think the coverage of, of Al Qaeda by the journalistic community has been pretty good. I mean, it's not surprising. This was our biggest national security problem. I mean, the, the question for John, perhaps, is what was the coverage like, you know, before 9/11, and how does it compare now? And and what would you say about that? I would say um, it was challenged. Mm -hmm. I mean, remember when when the embassy bombings unfolded, um, they were a big story at the time, but they were quickly overshadowed by a story about um, a Washington intern named Monica Lewinsky, mm -hmm. which actually drove coverage away. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't just terrorism that suffered. Mm -hmm. For the first time in recent memory, the Pope had traveled to Cuba mm -hmm. 
in a groundbreaking um, visit to a I was there, <laughs> and like the entire press corps left. Was called back. Yeah. I mean, seriously, like, like everybody left. It was you know the, this historic visit of the Pope to Cuba, and everybody went back to Washington because of Monica Lewinsky. So, <laughs> I, I I guess I rest my case there. Right, but sure. I'm saying that, and we all remember that absolutely. Sell, selling those stories in the newsroom right. because they were expensive, mm -hmm. uh, they were risky, and you never were quite sure what the result was going to be, whether that was going to get an interview. Um, or just spending a long time trying to crack what a certain plot or investigation might be was a tougher sell mm -hmm. than it should have been. And, and a story that was harder to understand, harder to explain, harder to, to make people feel the relevance of it to our life every day. Well, Frank, I'll tell you the flip side though, and I remember thinking this very consciously at the time because I was one of those people like Peter who was always baying in the woods saying, you know, we've got to get this stuff on. When 9-11 happened, um, America had one of its worst moments in history, certainly since Pearl Harbor. And journalism may have had one of its finest in that dark hour, in that they tossed out the commercials, they went wall-to-wall -wall coverage, they started sharing material. Um, so if somebody's helicopter got the shot of something happening, that somebody's, all competition was suspended. Anybody could hop on anybody's live feed and pick out anything they wanted. And they stayed with that story and then did serious journalism about safety, about terrorism, about national security for a long time, fairly unabated. And it shows that whatever the yings and yangs or ebbs and flows of journalism will be as, as it fights to stay relevant against entertainment media and so on, um, when the chips are down, I think journalism, television in particular, really came through and showed what it could do to report the story, allay public fears, give perspective on what to worry about and what not. And that continued through the anthrax attacks mm -hmm. and so on. So mm -hmm. it was a tough period, but I think in some ways for journalists, a good period. I want to get some audience questions, but before I do, I want to play one more clip because, John, in our video, we see that when you interviewed bin Laden, you also met another man we've come to hear a lot about, especially this weekend. Let's watch this next clip. One of the intermediaries who arranged the bin Laden interview was Ayman al-Zawahiri, the leader of Egyptian Islamic Jihad, who was working with al-Qaeda. He said, there is one other thing. I said, what's that? He said, we will not translate his answers to you. I said, well, that's not going to work very well because <laughs> if you don't translate the answers to me, how am I going to ask the follow-up question? And he said, that'll be no problem there will be no follow-up questions. <laughs> so they had, a, they had a media strategy in place that was pretty challenging. Bin Laden's answers were translated into English when the crew got back to New York. So as we were leaving, I said to Zawahiri, Dr. Zawahiri, what does it mean to declare war on America, to issue this fatwa? Because I was thinking, it sounds a tad hyperbolic. I mean, there's a couple of thousand of you spread between a few camps not exactly ready to declare war on a superpower. And he said, oh, you will see the results of this fatwa in the next several weeks. Watch the media. After the embassy bombings, it went from being an interesting interview of questionable significance to a significant interview. And the cell phone rang, and it was the New York news desk at ABC News, and they said, Peter Jennings asked us to call. Two U.S. embassies have blown up simultaneously by massive truck bombs. There are numerous casualties. One is in Nairobi, Kenya. The other is in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. What is the issue with East Africa that would make these two embassies the target? And I thought for a second. I said, tell Peter Jennings there's no issue with East Africa that makes these embassies the target. Remember that interview um, we did almost two months ago back in, in May with Osama bin Laden? He declared war in America. And the desk assistant, it kind of registered, oh yeah, the guy in Afghanistan, right, right. I said, well, tell Peter, the war just started. And in fact, it had. John, tell us about the learning curve of a news organization when, when you realize that, boy, this nugget that was over in the corner is pure gold. Well, you know, I think it was interesting. As hard as it was to sell that interview within the organization, it was Chris Isham who ran the investigative unit, um, who was much more familiar of the wheeling and dealing of big network news than I was, who talked to Ted Koppel and his producer, talked to Peter Jennings and his producer, and said, 
let's split the cost between the two shows and you can both have a different version of the interview and that's and that's how it got done rune arledge um, who was at the end of his abc time there when it played on nightline said that's exactly what we're in the news business for mm -hmm. david weston who was the president said that's the kind of story i want to see so they got the end result. It was just the concept that was a problem. After the embassy bombings, though, we realized we were sitting on um, one of the only two places that actually had not just in not just in footage of him, but him actually talking mm -hmm. and really foreshadowing that event. And that interview became significant again after the coal and and the, and certainly more after 9/11. But the the trick of it is. After that interview, he never had to do another interview again. Mm -hmm. With the advent of YouTube, mm -hmm. with the cheap video cameras, with social media and globalization, mm -hmm. Osama bin Laden didn't have to go through the, the hoops of the security risks of bringing in a Peter Bergen mm -hmm. or smuggling in a John Miller to reach America. He could record it on a cell phone, mm -hmm. upload it, and talk to the world, and that would be picked up by network news around the globe and by his acolytes on the internet with equal speed. So the democratization of television um, certainly changed the communications of terrorism. And Peter, how much more difficult does that make the job of the journalist when you have someone who has unfiltered access to, to the public and, and you have to figure out, number one, is this authentic? Number two, is it current? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Before you present this material, well, the public's already seen it because they've gone straight to the internet. Yeah, well, you know, Bin Laden has released a number of videotapes, uh, as, as John pointed out, that were sen essentially home productions after 9-11. And, and you, can, you can see in the search of his compound, they have the right. kind of the rehearsals the for other home the productions. The outtakes or the... So, you know, even you know, Al Jazeera came in for a lot of criticism after 9-11, but I think actually, whether it was Al Jazeera or ABC News or CNN, people, the way that these were handled were pretty much, generally speaking, uh, there were news judgments made, which is, we're not just going to like put a half an hour audio, you know, videotape of Bin Laden out there. Is there news? Um, and and you know what is the news? And we'll have a two-minute clip. Um, I mean, you can't, you couldn't really ignore these things because it, let's say a videotape was pretty unusual, uh, particularly from Bin Laden. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you didn't want to give him a huge propaganda advantage by playing the whole thing. I mean, you, I'll give you an example of where a videotape from Bin Laden. I think you know, if Senator John Kerry was here, he he would say that. Bin Laden's appearance four days, five days before the 2004 election cost him the election. You may recall that we hadn't seen a videotape from Bin Laden for some period of time. Suddenly up, up he pops five days before the election and both the Bush camp and the Kerry camp didn't know what, really what to make of it because it had advantages and disadvantages for both of them. Disadvantage for Bush was Bin Laden's still out there, you didn't get him and that was a Kerry campaign theme. Disadvantage for Kerry was Bush is a strong on pre terrorism president, quote unquote. Um, and Kerry was, it was neck and neck, and over the weekend, the entire discourse about the election became the war on terror, mm -hmm. which Kerry would say benefited Bush. So these videotapes, you know, they were significant. I mean, and in Kerry's view, they, they lost him the election. Mm -hmm. And Frank, I think you also have to look at the changing milieu of bin Laden's um, image control. So mm -hmm. when Peter talks to bin Laden, when I talk to him, he's a guy wearing military fatigues. That's symbolism. I'm a frontline military guy. He's carrying a weapon, you know, that means I'm, I'm part of this army. He sits in front of a map of the world. Uh, but when you looked at the video that Peter's referring to around the election, here's Osama bin Laden. He sits there. He's got a background behind him. He's got a desk in front of him. He's reading from a prepared script. He's dressed in formal gold, gilded, traditional Saudi clothing. It's, it's as if he's saying, I'm not just the military leader of a ragtag group in a camp. I am now the policy director of a global organization who is addressing the world from the Oval Cave, mm -hmm. um, kind of, <laughs> kind of um, setting what I think should be policy sure. for American politics. Sure. And that was a, a sweeping change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, if we have any questions from the audience, and once again, we have microphones, if you just wave your hand. Uh, we've got one right here. If we can get a microphone to the young woman in the turquoise top. You can tell us who you are and where you're from, and then go ahead. John Ann Broadbent from Baltimore. Mm -hmm. First, I would like to express my appreciation and gratitude to uh, journalists and uh, analysts like you who make it possible for us to sit in our safe, comfortable living room and know what's going on all over the world in corners we wouldn't get to. Mm -hmm. 
So related to that, my question is, you, when you do these things, there's clearly physical danger. Um, what is the personal cost to you in terms of your relationships, your life, your family, people around you? Interesting question. Um, at the time I did this, um, I was single, didn't have children. Um, the calculus would be more difficult today. Um, I remember after it was on the air, my mother called me at home. I thought she was <laughs> going to say, I didn't even know you went there. What a fascinating story. She said, you are not allowed to go to <laughs> Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> she yelled at me for like 10 minutes. So there's that. Um, I, I think the, the flip side, though, is um, not all the stories turned out that well. You see the Daniel Pearl story, and you see others like that, and you realize that this idea of the journalist as a neutral party who is there to, you know, put together an unbiased story and carry it out, um, we don't have that assurance anymore. You don't really know what you're walking into. And I don't think either Peter and I were 100% sure of what we were walking into, except that the calculus was, and I don't know if you agree with this, they seem to want to get a message out, and they seem not to know how to do it without us. So that was some assurance that we'd probably get in and we'd probably get out at least within the control of the people we were with. Now, there were wild cards along the way, um, which even they had no control over. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with John. It would, you know, if they'd invited us, it would be kind of stepped on the message if they then kidnapped us, you know. Um, the, you know, the message they were trying to do is, you know, we've got a political plan and here it is, and they, they said it to us and they also said it to John. Um, but then the reason that they wanted to get the message out to CNN and, and, and ABC News was they knew, they'd been planning the attacks on the embassy Af embassies in Africa since 93. They didn't want the attack to happen without having explained that they're at war with the United States, even though they couldn't complete, they couldn't claim complete credit for the attacks because they were saying simultaneously that they weren't responsible because if they had said they were responsible, then the Taliban would have had to expel them. Uh, so they were kind of trying to put a out, marker out there that they were at war with the United States before this event in, in Africa where they blew up the two U.S. embassies. But I think, you know, da uh, John mentioned Daniel Pearl. The rules changed. Daniel Pearl was killed in January of 2002. Up to that point, journalists in Pakistan and Afghanistan hadn't been killed just because they were doing their jobs. And now, of course, you know, Pakistan is in fact today the most dangerous, world, uh, dangerous country in the world to be a journalist. So, you know, it, it is much more complicated now. Mm -hmm. We have a question up at the top. If we can get a microphone up there. And I'm going to wait and let this be the next question to come in. So, yes, sir. Hi, uh, Dave Price from the DC area. Question. Uh, like Adolf Hitler, Osama bin Laden's become, you know, and now a dead embodiment, but once a living embodiment of evil. And you two gentlemen have met him. As you're sitting there in the room, um, did you pick up on that? Obviously, as you said, he had a motive, he had a method, he's acting. But, you know, Osama bin Laden, the person, I mean, what kind of vibe, what kind of thing in the room? You know, I would say no. And what I mean by that, I want to reflect on something that Peter said a few minutes ago, which is, if you didn't understand Arabic and you just listened to his tone of voice, you thought he was telling you a bedtime story. <laughs> um, you know, he came in with this cane, he sat down, he spoke in this soft, lilting voice. His answers were long and almost droning. Um, and only when you got the translation did you get that. So you didn't get that sense of evil. What you did get, at least from my standpoint, was the people in the camps, and we had to stay there for a number of days leading up to the interviews, would have followed him uh, into hell. Um, they were dedicated to him and, um, and inspired by him. So um, more than the, the face of evil, it was um, a leadership quality, although a dark leadership quality because it was for evil, and a charisma that just seemed to work with that message. Yeah, I mean, and also, you know, when John and I had met him, he hadn't done anything. I mean, so. Uh, but I didn't get it. I, I, I found him to be uh, neither particularly charismatic nor particularly uncharismatic. I mean, also, John and I were both doing a job. And when you're doing a job like that, it's like, you know, are we, is the lighting right? Uh, you know, have we asked the right questions? Are we rolling? Are we rolling? <laughs> <laughs> there are some basic things that you kind of are preoccupied with. And, 
he, he wasn't trying to be, he was neither friendly nor unfriendly. Quick, quick story, leading up to the interview, I'm trying to convince them to give us the interview. So I'm meeting with intermediaries in London and I said, look, they said, why should he do this interview? I said, his key items seem to be, he wants a homeland for the Palestinians, the US out of Saudi Arabia because he feels it's religious desecration, and an end to the no-fly zone in Iraq because he thinks women and children are, are starving. I, I think if we frame those issues, and let him explain them, he could sound reasonable and reach an American audience. And it was one of the intermediaries who said, whoa, we don't want him to sound too reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, to reflect on your question, what they were saying is, if the, if the object of the game is to deliver a message that I'm declaring war on America and I'm a big scary terrorist in a cave and you better watch out, you sure don't want to sound reasonable. So this was part of their strategy. Yeah. So, so now the complexity of the footing in the war on terror we have two alliances that are very challenging and, and problematic, one with Afghanistan and one with Pakistan. As journalists, how do we make sure that we keep hold of that story in a way that an American news audience can kind of understand what's going on in the world? Well, my wife is in the audience and we met in Afghanistan. We were both together in Pakistan in July, so um, we've spent a fair amount of time there. I mean, I think Pakistan has got um, a huge image problem in the United States right now, which isn't really entirely uh, merited. Um, you know, they just did arrest a uh, senior member of Al-Qaeda uh, on Friday in a Pakistani city with American help. And they have arrested quite a number of leaders of Al-Qaeda. But the fact that bin Laden was found there, uh, you know, the fact that we're giving them aid and uh, they're a sort of unreliable ally in some people's minds is, uh, that's kind of the, the, the picture of it is fairly routine. There is another story. I mean, they fought the Taliban very bravely in South Waziristan and SWAT. My wife covered that for National Geographic. Um, you know, and in Afghanistan, we're going to be there for a long time, and we should be, I think. I mean, uh, we're negotiating an agreement with the Afghan government now to be there past 2014. Um, we're still in Okinawa six and a half decades after the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we have a sort of national security interest somewhere, appropriately, we, we stay, and we've abandoned Afghanistan in the past. It's been a very expensive thing to do. Um, we closed our embassy there in 1989. So, you know, uh, as a journalist, I have a responsibility, and I think, you know, to, to try and explain some of these things. Afghani there is Afghanistanism still today, uh, in a sense. It's a faraway country, hard to understand. But I'm actually quite bullish on the future of Afghanistan. Afghans mostly are, uh, you know, one of the most common polling questions you can ask is, do you, thi do you think your country's going in the right direction? Most Americans don't think the country's going in the right direction now. Most Afghans think their country's going in the right direction because they, you know, it's their expectations are pretty low. But what they're getting today is much better than what they've had mm -hmm. in the last three and a half decades. I mean, John and I were there under the Taliban. It was pretty grim. I mean, mm -hmm. there is no great nostalgia for this. There's nothing like living under the Taliban to have a fairly healthy skepticism about what <laughs> life would be like <laughs> <laughs> when they come back. Sure. John, your, your assessment of our... Uh, I'll save you airtime. I okay. agree with everything Peter said. Okay. It's, um, right. it's not a question that works in, in sound bites or bumper stickers. Right. It's hard to explain, but right. relationship with Pakistan, very complicated, and I think they summed Afghanistan up dead on. How about attitudes here in America in terms of uh, backlash where Islamic extremists kind of taint the, the, the feeling about Islam in general? Have we gotten beyond that? Are we trending toward or away from kind of welcoming tolerance of practicing Muslims here in America? That is another complicated question because you've, you've got one thing which is the, the hot button item which is every time they make an arrest of somebody in a plot and it turns out to be a Muslim from a Muslim community or a convert um, because of the media saturation, that community is looked at with a giant shadow cast over it. And then you've got the rest of the world living in the Muslim communities of America, including the Arab American communities that aren't Muslim, including um, other communities, even the Sikhs, mm -hmm. um, you know, because they wear a turban, mm -hmm. get, get caught in hate yes, crimes. Yes, yes. So there's a, there's a big effect there. I can tell you personally from my work at the FBI, where uh, the division I ran was in charge of community outreach to the Muslim community, um, they are they are um, vital to the country. Um, they love this country as much as we do. They are businessmen. They are raising families. Um, they are important women in the community, and and they're they're a vital part of America's fabric. And they're having a very hard time with this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
that's, that's the one side of the story. And the other side of the story is there's an extremist view that's using the tools of globalization, YouTube, the internet, chat rooms, that is plugging into um, disaffected corners of their youth, or even not disaffected people who are looking for adventure, mm -hmm. and using a very sophisticated set of messages. Mm -hmm. I'd point mm -hmm. to Amwar Alaki as a good example mm -hmm. um, to turn those people against the country they call home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we have any more questions out here. I, I have one, uh, we have one up here. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Carolyn Serban from the DC area. Um, if you could go back, what's the one question you wish you had asked? I have a, I can answer that. How can you justify the killing of um, civilians? I mean, we didn't know that he was about to do all these things, but that's, a and, and because, and, and a, and a kind of sub part of that would be, how do you justify the killing of Muslim civilians? Because that's a kind of real double whammy. I mean, we, you, the United States lost a huge propaganda advantage when the embassy attacks happened because two, more than 200 people died, 10 year in Tanzania are countries with very substantial Muslim populations. And we should have said only 12 Americans died in the embassy attacks. Almost all the victims were Africans, many of them Muslims. We should have said then and there, this guy is killing more Muslims than Americans. Um, because that's the real Achilles heel that these guys have is they position themselves as the defenders of Islam and yet most of their victims have been, been Muslim civilians. So the question I would have thought to him was, how do you justify the killing of innocent civilians? Okay, but because I'm actually a much better interviewer than Peter, <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, both of them. <laughs> so, okay, well. Uh, but, but I have to frame that in the fact that I got to this a year after he did, so <laughs> all, all, all fair. But, um, his answer was fascinating. I'll tell you exactly what he said. I said, how can you justify the bombing of the World Trade Center? Now I'll stop tape here because I'm talking about the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center where you've got innocent women, civilians, um, non-combatants, and compare that in your war with America. On the same plane you said, this is like our great battle with the Russians. Mm -hmm. One is fighting other soldiers on the field of battle, the other is fighting innocents on their way to work in school. And he said, that's a very interesting question coming from an American. This has been Laden talking now. He said, was it not your country who gave us Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Were there no innocent William, women or civilians there? Were there no children there or other non-combatants? We are simply taking the tools of terror that you have launched against other peoples and turning them on you. Um, so it was an interesting rationale. After the embassy bombings, our mutual friend Rahimullah Yousafzai mm. um, uh, with an ABC crew reached Bin Laden on Christmas Eve and said, what about the number of Muslims and Africans that were killed if America was your target? You, you murdered your own people. And his rationale again, because it's all rationalization, was, well, if they were truly good Muslims and they died in the embassy bombings, that was their destiny um, by Allah, and therefore um, they will die as martyrs and go to paradise. Mm -hmm. So in the world of propaganda, mm -hmm. when you're talking about the business of terrorism, these guys have crafted an answer for everything. Mm -hmm. But to reflect on Peter's observation, none of it makes any mm -hmm. sense. Well, tell me this, uh, t speaking of the tools of war, um, our use of drones. Is drone technology something that we should be worried about now, given that it's, it's fairly inexpensive, it's, it's, it's simple put together, it's largely the components are made in China and, and elsewhere. Is that something that, that we should be concerned about looking forward being used against us? Uh, I got to part with you on the fairly inexpensive part, but remember, I mean, in the government, oh. we purchase them at a certain rate. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, but Peter spent a lot of time in the area. Out yeah, there. well, you know, we, at the New America Foundation where I work, we, we, have a, you can, we have a tool, you can look at every drone strike in Pakistan, where, the, where it happened, who, who the victims were, uh, on a Google Maps that we've put together. Um, you know, the Libyan rebels had got their own drone, you know, and the reason I, I and, and that it, it was expensive, but it, they had their own drone. And this is a ragtag bunch of folks. So. Uh, drone technology, you know, before 9-11, the United States had drones that were only surveillance drones. After 9-11, mm -hmm. we armed them. We don't, we don't have a monopoly on this technology. The China, Pakistan has its own surveillance drones. So very, very shortly, other countries are going to arm their own drones. And if we set a set of uh, precedents, uh, we need to be think pretty carefully about how we are. Because let's say the Chinese start using them in Tibet. Mm -hmm. And uh, we say, hey, that's not kosher. 
um, you know, I think the Chinese are going to be able to say, uh, well, uh, actually, you've been doing this in, uh, in a certain way, in a very secretive way. I, my, my thing about the drones, the ones that the CIA uses in Pakistan, would be that the civilian casualty rate is pretty low. Uh, we should do it with more buy-in from the Pakistanis. The quid pro quo is they'd have to take more public ownership for them because we're giving them with some of their help. Uh, but it, you know, the fact that it's so secret, and it's, uh, by the way, when big hunks of metal drop out of the sky and blow up, they're not really secret. So mm -hmm. this is the least, this is the worst kept secret in the history of secrecy. And we should stop pretending that it's secret. And we should sort of say, you know, actually we have a program which is killing the enemies of Pakistan. They're our enemies as well. Uh, we should fest, we should be able to defend it more publicly, in public, in a public space. Mm -hmm. In terms of framing issues and understanding, the phrase war on terror, is it useful? Do you see it being retired at any time? Uh, wh where do we stand now when, when we speak of war on terror? I didn't find it particularly uh, useful then or now. Um, <laughs> terror is, um, is not an enemy, it's a tactic. Mm -hmm. um, I found it a little confusing and, you know, casting of a broad brush. Um, but that's, that's just me. I think the war against Al-Qaeda mm -hmm. um, is much simpler. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me this, and, and Peter, let's start with you on this. We've seen this Arab Spring. Uh, we have seen revolution. Uh, we've seen some pushback further over in the Middle East. Does this create opportunities or, 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 or problems for Al-Qaeda in terms of their mission, in terms of the world they want to see emerge? Uh, Yogi Berra said it's hard to make predictions, particularly about the future. So, um, <laughs> and uh, so lots of things can happen in the Arab world. And it's an, um, you know, particularly when we've got civil wars going on in Libya and Yemen um, and, and Syria, I think will dev devolve into a civil war. Certainly Al-Qaeda opportunistically will try and take advantage of that. Al-Qaeda and its allies have already done so in Yemen. Yemen, they've already had a, something of a foothold. The fact that it's even more chaotic than it was a year ago helps them. But on the other hand, does that you know, devalue the Arab Spring? I mean, no. I mean, I think we tend to, everything that happens in the Middle East, we tend to sort of see through, what does it mean for Israel? What does it mean for Al-Qaeda? What does yeah. it mean for Iran? You know, actually, Iran, Israel, and Al-Qaeda are sort of kind of irrelevant to much of this. What is really happening is that when the Arab, when, you know, Arabs were no different than anybody else. What they really wanted was an accountable government, free press, independent judiciary, exactly the things that anybody else wants. So, you know, they weren't different. And so when they come, one thing that was fascinating to me is I haven't seen a single picture of Osama bin Laden in any of these protests. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen a single American flag being burnt. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen a single Israeli flag being burnt. I mean, these questions are kind of irrelevant. What they want is, you know, essentially what most other people now in the world have, which is something of an accountable government. And, and that's, a, that's a point of clarity now. So, so does it um, distract from this mission of death to America, if you will, as, as a primary focus for Al-Qaeda? I think it does damage to Al-Qaeda's business model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the idea is, and, and you know, Ayman al-Zawahiri, before he was Al-Qaeda, the head of uh, Egyptian Islamic Jihad, you know, spent 23 years trying to unseat uh, right. the Egyptian government. Mm -hmm. and a large crowd using social media and smartphones did it in three and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask yourself, have these smart kids found a way to bring sweeping social change through a smarter understanding of how to use social media to gather popular dissent? Mm -hmm. um, and if they did, without blowing anything up or killing lots of people, are the rest of the smart kids who might be on the other end of that message from Omar al saying, join Al-Qaeda, kill people, it's the way to change, be saying, geez, I think there's a better, faster, cleaner, more effective way mm -hmm. um, to change. And I think that, that hurt Al-Qaeda. Um, I agree with Peter, though, that uh, to a quote, uh, was it Yogi Berra, allude, it ain't over till it's over? <laughs> um, you have to see the outcomes of these things, because Al-Qaeda, if we end up with worse dictatorships and less free societies and more brutality at the end of this, Al-Qaeda will argue it doesn't work. And so, Peter, has the United States taken the right steps so far in, in terms of, as this change goes on, to be in a position to help it or at least not hinder it going in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, there are mostly least bad options in all this. There's no sort mm -hmm. of magic. Uh, we've had a kind of you know, mixed message we kind of initially said about Mubarak, he, you know, it's important that he stays. I, mean, I think Vice President Biden said something like that initially, and then we became clear that he wasn't going to stay, and we were, you know, obviously very definitive about Gaddafi. Um, 
you know, in Bahrain, we sort of let the Saudis, you know, go in and put the uh, insurrection down. Uh, so, you know, uh, it is, a, you know, to some degree it is about how much oil you have. I mean, uh, we're going to give a sort of a pass to some countries who are absolutely, in, in, you know, very important to our economy. Mm -hmm. um, and Gaddafi was an international pariah. I mean, I, I think the president did exactly the right thing with Libya. I couldn't believe the criticism he was getting uh, for, you know, bring, you know, having this operation against Gaddafi. I thought, you know, Gaddafi is a person who's got the bloods of hundreds of Americans on his hands, British citizens, he's an international pariah, the, he has no allies. If we can't sort of stand up against him, who can we stand up against? And if we hadn't done something with Gaddafi, I think the situation in Syria and other places would be infinitely worse than it is already. Mm -hmm. I mean, but at least by sort of saying this will not stand, um, you know, we put down a marker that I think is well recognized in the region. And, you know, Gaddafi is no longer in power. Uh, Lib will Libya be a better place without him? I'm sure it will be. Might it, will it still have significant problems? Yes. Will Egypt still have significant problems? You'd have to be, um, you know, an economic genius to solve Egypt, uh, Egypt's economic problems, and whoever comes in is not going to be that person, I don't think. So, you know, it, you know there's a lot of history still to be made. Mm -hmm. You're both going to be at Ground Zero tomorrow, 9-11, 10 years later. Tell us a little about what feelings you're going to be taking to that place and what your expectation is uh, of, of tomorrow, being there. Well, John was in New York, uh, you know, uh, with Peter Jennings. Um, so I, I was here. I mean, I, uh, my memory of 9-11 is I was going into CNN because Akram Shah Massoud had just been killed by, it turned out, Al-Qaeda, we later find out. Akram Shah Massoud had died on September 9th, and it was, it was sort of covered up, and I went in. I'd I began to hear that he really was dead. He was really the last thing that stood between the Taliban and taking over Afghanistan entirely. So I was going in as, uh, to CNN as the, the event happened. Um, you know, I mean, what a, you know, I, I, it's a very hard kind of question to answer because you don't know how you're, you're going to react emotionally until you're sort of there. But I remember the cab driver that took, was taking me into CNN just burst into tears, and he was Ethiopian. I was like, wow, this is pretty intense. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a very, anybody who was in Washington that day, you know, the State Department was on fire. There was a lot of sort of misinformation about what was going on. It was extremely confusing. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but the one, you know, what was going through my mind that, that day was as soon as the second plane hit, this is Osama bin Laden. I mean, and I, I was able to say that. Of course, you know, news organizations are inherently conservative. They don't want to get out too far. But I went back and looked at videotape, and I was able to say that on CNN at 1 o'clock that day, essentially saying, who has the capability and who has the intent? There are quite a lot of people who might have some kind of intent to attack the United States, but most of them are not dumb enough to do it. And, um, and then there are very few people who have the capability and this sort of ca combination that there was only one plausible candidate, uh, which was bin Laden and al-Qaeda. And um, so that you know, was a very intense time period, as we all recall. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's going to be, um, I'm going to have to actually see how it goes. Uh, I remember covering the events live for a couple of days straight on the air, just taking catnaps in the, in the office, um, and Peter Jennings stayed throughout. Then I remember um, getting in a police car with, um, with Jerry Kane and driving down to Ground Zero, I mean right there to the smoking pile, um, and taking that in because it was one thing to cover it live, watching the footage and add perspective from a terrorism expertise standpoint, Peter was doing that, I was doing that, but it's another thing to go down there and to realize one of my best friends on earth, you know, John O'Neill, was still somewhere in there. Um, so many police officers that I knew, um, fire, uh, the entire fire department command staff, most of whom I knew personally, um, personal friends who just happened to work there, mm -hmm. um, and to take that in. And, you know, that's the, the personal side of the business. You try to remain detached on the air, but you're still a human being. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow, I think a lot of that will be coming back. And, you know, you have to ask yourself, is 10 years enough? Do, does it, do you stand back enough from it? Mm -hmm. I want to close with a, a question, just a quick answer from each of you. We often speak of journalism as the first rough draft of history. What do you think is the most significant nugget of understanding or information that the journalism has provided in the decades since that attack? I think it boils down to um, a number of books. I think um, The Looming Tower, um, 
by uh, the New Yorker uh, writer, um, Lawrence Wright, was probably the, the, the seminal work at the entire arc of history of how Al-Qaeda came to be. I think Peter's uh, first book, which came out um, in a, in the, the timing couldn't have been better or worse, depending, um, but it was Terror, Inc., which was really the inside story of Al-Qaeda itself, um, came out right at, was it 9-11? I, I finished it 10 days before 9-11. Um, and, and, and his latest book, The Longest War, which is actually the perspective piece that, that pulls all this together. Um, I think there's probably half a dozen of those books that really mark this era with, ability, with an ability to understand it mm -hmm. beyond the newsflash. Mm -hmm. Peter, anything to add? Well, thank you, John, for those kind of words. Um, this is the part where you mention my book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Cell. <laughs> Which was a brilliant, a brilliant book. All right, we're done with that now. <laughs> I think, you know, I mean, look, I, I, it's not just a book. I mean, I think the journalists have done a terrific job on covering Al Qaeda, you know, after, you know, the, the New York Times won six Pulitzer Prizes in 2001, or maybe seven, if a, rightly so. And then, uh, you know, CNN and every other, ABC News and every other, you know, we've had a lot of our um, colleagues have been kidnapped or, you know, maimed for life or killed. Um, you know, it's not without cost, and you know, we've, I think we've done a pretty good job overall. Um, and um, if we haven't, part of it also is, it, this may not be a very um, comfortable thing to say, but I mean, we are um, taking cues from the public, and if the public says we don't care about Afghanistan or Pakistan or Iraq, that's a pretty big signal, because at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're a business that has to function sort of quasi like a business uh, with and so, um, you know, the public needs to demand good journalism and it will get it. If it doesn't, then it won't get it. I'd, I'd, I'd also like to say what the museum has done. The 9-11 standing exhibit upstairs has been brilliant mm -hmm. and a place for people all over the world to go. Mm -hmm. uh, the journalist and G-Men um, updated version with the 9-11 material in it now is another great place to look at it for people who are trying to get um, perspective on history. And you certainly have given us some perspective, a lot of insight, a lot of things to think about. John Miller, Peter Bergen, thank you so much for joining us here this afternoon. Thank you, thank you for your questions as well. Good job. <laughs> and once again, Peter is going to be uh, signing his book uh, right here, right after the program. Our next Inside Media will be September 25th. Our guest will be Juan Williams. His book, Muzzled, The Assault on Honest Debate, Chronicles his very public firing from NPR in 2010 and the context of the ways he sees honest political debate in America stifled. That's on September 25th. In the meantime, thanks for joining us here at the Knight Studio for Inside Media. We hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. So long. And thanks, Mike. Thank you, Frank, very much. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Appreciate it. Good job. Thanks. <laughs>